Tonight we're going to pick up from the, the doctrine of divine healing. Let's go into um, the origin of sickness. All right? Um, now, if you study the Bible, uh, and, and if you're studying the subject of divine healing, it is absolutely essential to grasp where it came from. If you do not know where sickness comes from, you cannot exercise faith to deal with it. Amen? Um, you can't believe God to be healed if you believe God made you sick. Is that, are y'all here? Um, and so and you won't be able to view sickness from the same place that God views it until you know where it came from. Hallelujah. So we're going we're gonna to begin to study this. And, and let me just go ahead and put out here the premise. Sickness is a result of sin. Okay? Its presence in the world can be directly traced to the influence and power of Satan. So let's look at that first historically. Now, now let me say, as we said this before, we'll say it again. Sickness is in the earth because of sin. Does not mean that because you got sick, you, you sinned last week. No, its entrance into the world is because of sin. All right? And so we want to we make sure we're, we're real clear on that. But its, it's influence is... It's, uh, it's functioning on the earth. Now, um, theologically, it's very hard to, dis to uh, disagree with the fact that because of sin, sickness came into the world. Man was created in God's image. Uh, if he had not sinned, he would not have been sick. Okay, there was no sickness. There was no weakness. He was designed to live forever. Um, you know, uh, Romans 5, 12 says, whereby one man sin entered into the world, uh, and death by sin, and so death passed from all men. Now, um, one theological perspective is that death is a result of sin, sickness being matured. And in, in one sense, if you look at that, uh, we age because of a mutation of our cells. Every seven years, your, and your entire body replaces all of its cells over a seven-year period. The body, every cell in your body is replaced, except there is a defect in it, and they age. Now, God created us to replace ourselves every seven years. And not age. But because of sin entered into the world, there was a mutation of the cells. And so every seven years, we get a little bit older and get older and get older and get older and get older. And those cells are mutating. They're not coming back regenerated in youth. They're coming back regenerated and aged. Okay? So the physical, so in one sense of that, that is a, that is a, um, a digression of the, the human makeup, of, of the physical makeup. So in one sense, you could say that is sickness in one sense. Okay? Um, anyway, so I, I don't have to believe you have to be sick to die. In other words, you don't have to have pneumonia to die. You can just pack it up and leave. Amen? I mean, you can just pack it up and leave. So, so sick, but, but along that line, therefore, sickness must be a result of sin since greater death contains the lesser sickness. Amen? Um, again, if there had been no sin in the world, there would be no sickness. Sickness is therefore the result of sin and may be traced to the influence of power of Satan specifically uh, in these following illustrations. The affliction that came upon Job. Now, look at Job chapter 2, verse 7. It says Job chapter 2. Now I know... Let's just go ahead and read Job 2, starting in verse 1. And again, there was a day when the sons of God came before the presence of God, before the Lord, and Satan came on, among them also to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in, in the earth and walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Now, where had Satan been? He had been going all over the world, hadn't he? Walking up and down in it. And then God goes, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth. Now, here's how we read it, uh, a modern church theologically. Man, I know, you, how in the world did you miss Job? That's how we, that's how we view that scripture. The Hebrew actually says this, have you put your heart on my servant Job? Not considered my servant Job. Not, in other words, somehow or another, we, we take that and we turn it into, hey, devil, look, there's Job. You, met, you walked all over the earth and you missed him. Didn't even see him. And when you study this out, you find that he's the richest man in all the earth. He shews evil, loves God. And Satan missed him. That's how we read it. And then God turned the devil loose on Job. 
to prove that he would serve him. That's not what he said. He said, he said where did you, you come? He went away. God said to the devil, what are you here for? Well, I've been all over the earth. He said, and then God says, have you put your heart on my servant Job? Set your heart on him. Perfect, upright man, fears God, shews evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Where did this come from? Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And, the, and Satan answered, Lord, said, Skin for skin, yea, all the man hath he will give for his life. But put forth thine hand and touch his bone by his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said, Behold, that he is in thy hand, but save his life. Now let me say this. If we go on and read over to the, cha the third chapter, the 25th verse, we'll find out. Satan's there to find out what the legal parameters are in Job because, you know, how many know this? Job is the first book of the Bible. Did y'all know that? That's the oldest book in the Bible. It's before the laws, before any other books. Job, chronologically, is the oldest book in the Bible. <coughs> and so Job doesn't have the law to go back to. Amen? And so Satan comes before God. And Job has been doing stuff. Now, if you read this, he's been having, um, having week-long uh, repentance feast for his ungodly kids. They would get together and have birthday parties that lasted a week or so, and they wouldn't invite Dad. Dear old Dad wasn't invited. Why? Because they were, in, they, were, they, were, they were partying. They don't invite the Christian family member when they're going to party. Got family members like that? They're going to throw a big Halloween, get drunk, skank party or something. They, they, you don't get invited. Hello? What y'all doing tonight? Oh, well, you know, we just got a few folks over. These are pictures on Facebook. Now, I don't have, my family didn't do this, so I'm not, but you know. <clears throat> and, you look, and you think, my God, Jezebel, I mean, Jezebel looked like a saint. Hello? You know, why didn't you get invited? You would ruin the whole thing. Just your presence would mess it up. Are you here? Your presence would absolutely destroy the whole thing they were trying to accomplish. What were they trying to accomplish? Having party time. Here comes the Christian walking in, and everybody's kind of hiding the wine. They're hiding the booze. You know, they can't hide the fact they're half naked. Are you all here? Well, that's what's, going on. that's what's going on with Job's kids. Every time they had a birthday, every kid that had a birthday, they had a week-long celebration. They did a lot of partying. And then Job would say, call them all in. All right, guys, I know what y'all doing last week. Come on over to the house. I'm going to cleanse you, sanctify you and cleanse you because I, 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 he feared his heart that they had cursed God. And so he had a cleansing party. Now, he wasn't in faith about it. How do you know? Because Job 3.25 says, that which I feared has come upon me, and that which I greatly fear has befallen me. He got into fear. Let me say something. Fear opens the door to the devil. It is his inroads into your life. It's the opposite of faith. Amen? And so Satan comes to God. Now look, hey, notice that when Job was doing all this, he never did anything for himself. Why? He eschewed evil and lived righteously and perfectly before God. That's why when Satan went out of the presence of God, God said, you can't touch his life. You can't kill him. Amen? You know, so when we read this, we've got to read this with a little bit more uh, depth because God said, Although thou wouldst move me against him to destroy him or to swallow him up without cause. God said, you want me to destroy Job? There's no cause for me to destroy Job. And Satan said, yeah, um, but put forth your hand and he'll touch his bone he'll, and flesh and he'll curse you to your face. In other words, if you, if you put something on him, he'll, he'll do it. Now God said, behold, he's in your hand, but save his life. In other words, all right, so you came to find out where, where, where the hedge has been taken down. Hedge has been taken down. And we know everything that happened was because Job was afraid it was going to happen. But the one thing Job didn't fear for was his own life. How do we know? God said he couldn't touch his life. Everything else he feared happened. When all the news came, the kids getting killed, this happened, that happened, you know, and all the different things. Well, let's look over at Job 23. Job got boils, his wife, listen, who needs a wife like this? Curse God and die. Oh, you're, you're, you're a great bridesmaid, hallelujah. 
Verse 25 of chapter 3 says, For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. Now, Job, now, listen, you go and look at all this. His kids were killed. His, he had this morals all over him, all the different stuff. And then he says, I was afraid this was going to happen. Now, when Satan went to God, remember the sons of God came to present themselves before the throne of God. Satan was among them. And God says, why are you here? You know, I've been walking all over the earth. And God, God says, have you set your heart on my servant, Job? Yeah. And you're trying to move me to destroy him without cause. Well, if you, if you touch him, he'll curse you to your face. Well, he, was a, he was asking the question, how far can I go? That's what he was there for. He wanted to know. Because he's like, see, understand this. Spiritual beings still operate according to spiritual law. Y'all hear? What, what, what did the demons say? I know, we said, what's it got to do with sickness? You, you got to understand where it comes from. What did the demons who had possessed, uh, you know, the, the man, the legion say to Jesus when he showed up? Have you come to cast us out before the time? What are they talking about? What do you mean the time? We know who thou art. Thou art the Son of God. Have you come to cast us out before the time? What do you mean, what time? See, the spiritual law is in operation. See, Adam was given a lease on the earth. We, we, we kind of figured somewhere around the range of 6,000 years, human years, in, in our time frame. That's not necessarily an accurate, precise number, but somewhere in that time frame. And um, when, when he committed high treason in the Garden of Eden, did you notice God didn't come down and just snatch, snatch it out of Satan's hands? Why? Because there's spiritual laws in operation. There's spiritual laws in operation. God gave it to Adam. Adam gave it to the devil. God, by, by, you see, if God doesn't uphold or honor his own law, what does he become? He becomes subordinate to the one that he transgressed against. That's why it's impossible for God to lie. Why? Satan's the father of all liars. If God were to lie, he becomes subordinate to Satan. Satan would become the God of heaven if God were to lie. God is not a man that he should lie. No son of man that he should repent. So God can't lie. The moment he would lie, he would become subordinate to Satan. So anyway, when Adam committed high treason in the garden and sold the thing out to the devil, and Satan became the God of this world, now there are spiritual laws. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> The, the air conditioner got me right up my nose and got cold, tickled it, and then you had to sneeze. Praise the Lord. You come, I, I was somewhere the other day, and, and, and uh, I was I, I was substitute teaching. And one substitute, uh, one of the regular guys there, uh, B, Mo Blakeney, he was there. And he was, he, he was coughing or something in the, in the cafeteria. We had gone out to get something to drink. And one of the, one of the ladies working there said, you're, you're, uh, you're catching something. You're catching something. You're, oh, no, you're trying to catch a cold. That's what she kept telling. He said, no, I'm not. She said, you're trying to catch a cold. And, uh, and, and I got over, got over to the gym with him a couple minutes later. I said, so you ain't trying to catch a cold, are you? He said, no. He said, you ain't going to catch me saying that. <laughs> I said, no, I'll body slam it, but I ain't going to catch it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, my, 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 my. How did I get off on that? Oh, I know. Thank you. Anyway, I'm not catching a cold. Hallelujah. As one guy said, I'm catching a healing. Amen. Hallelujah. But, but um, when Adam sold out the Garden of Eden, he, he set in the motion the fact that all that God, all the authority and for the realm and time that, that God had given it to Adam was turned over to Satan. Now, God just couldn't step in there and snatch it from him. Oh, yes, he can. He, he, he could do anything. He can't violate his word. Can't violate. So, the, obviously, he gave man, he said, be fruitful, multiply, have the dominion over the earth and replenish it. He gave man dominion over the earth and told him to, he gave man the authority. Well, what happened? He turned it over to the devil. By spiritual law, Satan had authority. But what he did not know was how far can he go against somebody who's serving God? Because, see, he didn't want, you've got to understand, Satan made, we call him stupid. You know, Shambot used to call him Slewfoot. Yeah, it's all Slewfoot! Y'all remember Shambot? That's how you remember the word Shabbat in Hebrew. Shambot shouted, Shabbat, you shout to the Lord. Hallelujah. And uh, 
You know, we call them stupid. We call them stupid. Let me tell you something. Satan is an adversary. Now, we, 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 whatever we call him, Jesus didn't call him those things. You got to understand. You're dealing with an adversary who's 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 warped, but intelligent or smart in his warpedness. Kind of like some people on the earth right now. There are, people, there are evil people in the earth who are warped in their, their desires and plans, but they are intelligent or crafty in their warpedness. Okay? You know, uh, Mr. Mr. whatever his name from the, the Gospel Bill show. Warped, 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 warped. Ran the, ran the, he was the mayor or whatever his name. Mr. Tutwater. Yeah, T.W. Tutwater. You're warped, you're warped, you're warped. Y'all you remember that one? You remember that one? Yeah, there you go. Oh, the old gospel bill show. Hallelujah. Good stuff for kids. Hallelujah. Anyway, good stuff for adults. Teach your faith. <laughs> some folks just need to go back and watch gospel bill and get some faith in them again. Well, I'm 35. That's okay. It's good. Principles are principles. And um, we, we try to act like Satan is stupid. Satan's not stupid. The Bible says he can just see the very elect if left alone. So we have to understand we have an adversary that we have to deal with. Now, anyway, so uh, he wanted to find out what his spiritual authority was in the life of a man who eschewed evil and served God. And God said, you can touch everything but his life. And then, and then Job gives us the insight into why his life was held out. In verse 25 of chapter 3, the thing he was afraid of came on him and the thing he was greatly feared has come unto him, meaning he wasn't afraid for his own life. Everything that happened to Job, he, he was afraid would happen. He was afraid his kids would curse God and, would, and, and, and they would be killed or destroyed because of it, and they were. He was afraid that, that desolation would come to his life because of things, and it did. But when we look at this, and stepping back from that, because there's a lot of people who want to teach this and teach that God puts stuff on people and all that kind of stuff. Well, let me ask you a question. Um, why is it that those people that God's always putting stuff on never get the result of Job at the end? And God restored the captivity of Job. God turned the captivity of Job. Job got healed because God healed him. God restored everything he had double. You ever notice how people suffer? God puts someone on and they, and they always die with it. They never overcome it. And then, you know, they never get to do the part of that. Well, I'm suffering like Job. But how about, how about getting blessed like Job? How about recovering like Job? We never get that part, do we? We don't ever hear people teaching that part, you know? In Job 42.10, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he had prayed for his friends. So let's look at it this way. Let's just kind of, kind of strip off the other, other theological stuff. We know that what happened to Job is because Job opened the door through fear. Satan came. God did not, did not sick him on Job. Does that make sense? There's a difference between saying, well, you have a legal right to do this and putting them on them. You may not like the fact they have a legal right, but if they have a legal right, they have a legal right. I go up, you know, we travel in the mountains a lot. We love the Smoky Mountains. We love the different parks. And there are free First Amendment speech zones in the national parks. And the Lulus are there. Now, they got a box set off that's called the First Amendment. Now, it's amazing how in our national parks that the Christians and the crazies get to have a special place set aside called First Amendment zones, but anywhere else Christians go, they don't have one. But you know, you'll go up to the, you know, the, the, um, the Newfin Gap up there, going over from Cherokee to Gatlinburg or vice versa. And there's a, there's a place there. And, and most of the time, the people there are Krishnas. Ting, 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 with their little, their little ponytails and their little, their little smelly self. You know, they, they kind of are into a little of the India type stuff, the way they eat a lot of curry. You ever been around people who eat curry all the time? They smell like curry. They sweat curry. If you've ever been to India or Thailand or any place like that, and, and you get on a bus with people and it's hot and they're sweaty, they, they sweat curry because they eat it all the time. I'm not talking about red curry. I'm talking about the, the spice curry. All right. But notice that Satan went forth in the presence of God and smote Job. Who did the smiting? Satan. So who was the one who, in, who brought sickness into his life? God, now let me say this. I know a preacher said this in town one time on television. Satan is not God's puppy dog. Sent to, sent to be, you know, to unleash him on you. 
One of our charismatic pastors said that. He's not his puppy dog. He's not a tool. He is not the tool in God's hands. Are you here? Satan is opposed to the things of God, and God's opposed to the things of Satan. All right. Satan smote him, but then it says in, verse, in chapter 42, God healed him. So where does Satan come? It didn't come from God. Kind of interesting. Even if you believe that God sent the devil to Job, guess who didn't have any sickness to put on him? God didn't have any. Even if you're on that theological perspective that God, you know, God put the devil on Job and you, you don't believe a thing I just said, you know, it's still a fact that God didn't have any to give him. He had to send the devil to do it. Because God don't have any. So the origin of sickness is not with God. As a matter of fact, now, he didn't send the devil to get him healed. He did the healing. So what does that tell me? God don't have any sickness, but he's got help. So sickness or, or originates with the devil. Then what is healing? Healing is the removal. Remember, that? sickness is a foreign substance in the human body. It's not normal. What is healing? Is healing is the removal of that which doesn't belong there. Sin being removed from your life is you're, you're, you're born to be righteous. You were born to be righteous. God created man to be righteous. You're born again. You're created in the image of God once again. The removal of sin, the forgiveness of sin is the removal of that which doesn't belong. It's foreign to you. Sickness is foreign to your body. And your body does every... Why, how do you know that? Because your body does everything it can to fight it and get rid of it. You know, you, ever, you get attacked with a virus, you get a cold, and, and you got congestion. What is that congestion? That's your body fighting it. All that mucus and stuff is the body... Uh, coming against that thing, and, and the mucus is created out of that battle. Hello? You get a sword in your hand, and you, you know, it gets, we call it pus or, you know, whatever, you know, that, the, you know, whatever. What's that there for? That is the body fighting it. Your body does everything it can to combat sickness when it attacks the body, viral or bacterial. Your body fights against it. Why? It's not normal. It's not natural to you. I said it's not that you weren't created to have it. But it's in the earth because of Satan's fall. Now, let's move on. Those who Jesus healed were oppressed of the devil. Acts 10.38 says this. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of God for the devil was with him. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. It's not what it says, is it? You've got people who stand in their pulpits today and preach that if you lay hands on the sick to get them healed, you're of the devil. And then turn right around and preach that God had put that on them to teach them a lesson. I've heard it. That you're of the devil if you lay hands on the sick. The Bible says God, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil for god was with him though so people who were sick were oppressed of who satanic oppression now that doesn't mean you got a demon possession sickness is a form physical form of satanic oppression on your body doesn't mean you got a demon in you amen just like I mean, if we have a terrorist attack and they release anthrax and people get sick from anthrax doesn't mean you got a terrorist in your system you're, 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 what happened to you as a result of a terrorist attack, does that mean you got a terrorist in your living room? That the anthrax became a tool to, to enforce their will and design against the, against the nation, against people, population of the nation. Sickness is a design and tool in the hand of Satan to enforce uh, the, the results of sin in the earth on the physical body of God's creation. Now remember, we were, remember we talked about last week how we were created in the image of God. That our, that, that our bodies are, are to be glor to glor usually glorify God. That the body is the Lord's and the Lord's is the body's. Remember that? We did talk about that last week, didn't we? Okay? Last Sunday night? Satan hates, the, he just hates the way you look. Because even your fallen spiritual body, I mean your fallen nature of body, the body that's, at, that, that's going to be glor glorified or transfigured or transformed, still reminds him of God. He hates it. He works against it. 
in any ma- manner or method he may or can. Because he wants to destroy it. He wants to pervert it. He wants to bring it to destruction. But the Bible says that, that, that sickness was oppression from Satan on the body. Again, does not mean you have a demon in your body? But it does mean that it's from the devil. The woman who was bowed over 18 years, look in Luke 13, 16. Jesus, remember, remember the, the, those women in the synagogue? Of course, they're always looking to see if Jesus is going to do something on the Sabbath day. What better day to get healed than the Sabbath day? Amen? But you see, people get religious. There are six days in which to work. Men ought to come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath. I know they didn't say that here, but, you know, still. Um, well, let's look over there. We'll read a little bit more than what I have here. Luke. Luke. 13. Luke. I. I'm get, I think we need to order me a miniature bobblehead that'll stick up here. He's teaching in the synagogue, verse 10, and, uh, on the Sabbath, and verse 11. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity eight years. It was bowed together and could no wise lift herself up. When Jesus saw her, he called her unto him and said, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And they laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. You talk about a bunch of jerks. She'd been going there for 18 years, bowed over, sick, crippled, couldn't function. Jesus walks in, gets her healed, and they get ticked that she got healed. Now, there are people in America who get mad because Christians get healed by the laying on of hands. That's out of the devil. How could you be mad that someone got set free? What spirit are you of that you would rather than be sick so you can maintain your theological position, which is an error, by the way, to prove that you're right somehow and then be bound so you can be right? That's devilish. I said, that's devilish. You're devilish if you think that way. Jesus, you know, so go, there are six days in which men ought to work and then therefore come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. And Jesus answered him and said, thou hypocrite. Because see, we have more value of, of uh, certain life than we do of human life. Does not each one of you in the, in the Sabbath lose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman be, listen, now wait a second now. He's saying, now that you old you old sourpuss, you old jerky, devilish synagogue leader. You're more concerned about, you're probably upset that he showed you up, got her healed, and you didn't do anything those 18 years. Made you look bad. Because healing was provided for under the covenant of the law. Hello? Jesus turns around and calls him a hypocrite. And says, look, if your donkey needs to get water, you go loose him. In other words, you care more about animals. And does that true today? Save the baby wells and abort the human babies. That's the same devil running around out there. Hello? We'll put we'll on television programs of how they washed the ducks up in the, up in the bay where the Exxon oil spill took place. And we used Dawn dishwashing detergent and cleaned the little duckies up and put them back out there. I'm all for that. I, mean, I don't have any problem with that. But then we turn right around and have these militant lunatics that are screaming for the right to kill babies in their wombs. And the media supports their view. Promotes the view of saving the duck and kill the baby. Because it's fetal tissue. Hello? It's not life. It's fetal tissue. Texas went and passed a law and some liberal left-wing radical crazy lunatic demon-possessed judge struck it down because it said you had to be you had to do all abortions in a hospital 
Well, I think people should have the right to have an abortion. You need to read your Bible. God believes in the sanctity of life. Amen. Now, let me say something. The same bunch that protest, against abor protest for abortion protest against the death penalty. Now, you can have some lunatic who's raped and killed 35 women, cut them up into little pieces, burn them in the fire, eating their body like a cannibal, and they'll go out there and, and say, God says don't kill. And then turn right around and be over it and, you know, protesting for the right to have abortion. Actually, when the, you know, the Bible says thou shalt not kill in the, uh, in, in the Ten Commandments. And the King James says thou shalt not kill. It literally says thou shalt not take innocent life. That's what the Hebrew says. It doesn't say thou shalt not kill. It says thou shalt not take innocent life. I was up in Washington for Jesus in 1980. And, and it's my first experience with the loonies. I'd never encountered loonies until that day. And they're walking around in robes and they're barefooted. You've got shoes on your feet. You've you, you got signs up. You're murderers. The Bible says don't kill. You kill the animals for shoes on your feet. I was wearing synthetic. You know, wearing leather is killing the animals. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and, and, and you're thinking, you, you bozo. The same bunch, but they're protesting for the right to abortion. Don't touch my body. I got a right to my body. Yeah, you do. Don't get pregnant. That's real simple. There's your right to, your, to control your body. Don't get pregnant. If you do, have the baby. Who are you to tell me that? A man of God, speaking by the word of God. You don't have the right to kill that baby. You had a right not to get pregnant. To start with. You didn't mind a man touching your body before you got pregnant. Now you're going to come back and say, man, can't tell you what to do with your body after you get pregnant? Sorry. Yeah, the, the, arguments, the arguments are always flawed. I don't want a man telling me what to do with my body. You were letting him tell you what to do with your body a few months ago. When you were out having sex, didn't mind it then. That went over big. We better move along. <laughs> oh, that pharisaical spirit, you know. Um, how did I get way over there? It's amazing how, how fast I can get somewhere. At warp speed, we can get over to a whole other rail, rabbit trail. Amen. We're talking about the woman with the issue of blood. Talking about the Pharisee. Jesus called him a hypocrite. Oh, yeah, loving the animals more than God. There you go. Than people. Those Pharisees will, will, will take their donkey to get water, but you better not come and get healed on the Sabbath day. Listen to what Jesus goes on and says there. Ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham. Now, this, let me tell you something, folks, here. This is a real big key. You need to underline that phrase, daughter of Abraham. What does it mean, covenant woman? She's in covenant with God. See, Jesus specifically said, Ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham. Very, he, that was used with specificity, and it was used to, to declare that you have a covenant right. To, she had a covenant right to something. Whom, whom, who, whom, come on, whom, whom, whom has bound. Who did the binding? Not God. God wasn't doing it. Jesus didn't stop saying, no, the Lord's trying to teach her a lesson. He's done this to her. We don't know what it's going to be, but one day we'll figure it all out. Everybody figure it out. We'll go, oh, oh, wow, that's why the Lord did that. No, he said, whom Satan bound. He said the woman had a, ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, ought not this covenant woman of the lineage of Abraham, that Satan is bound 18 years, be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day. She had a right to it. God's covenant provided for her deliverance. Satan is the one who was enforcing this thing on her. And Jesus said she had a right to be free. She had the right to be free. He didn't say a thing about that she had learned her lesson, that God had been doing it, that God was trying to teach her something, that for 18 years she, and she, maybe she learned her lesson last week. He said that Satan had bound her for 18 years, and she was a covenant woman and had a right to be loosed. She had the right, the covenant right to be loosed from that thing. 
In other words, faith in what God had made provision for would set her free. Amen? And we're going to stop here. Okay, because the one, next one I'm going to get into is going to take me some time. And we're, next week we're going to get into the, the prophetic outline of Jesus' ministry. Amen? Teaches us where sickness came from. Okay? Okay? 